Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you might be, and welcome to another edition of Takeo Tuesday. I'm John Barba from Takeo Comfort Solutions, and we're really, really happy to have you with us here today. I don't know how it is where you are, but where we are, uh, it's starting to get a little cold, which if you're in the heat and business, that's the best day of the year, right? Uh, it's uh, starting to get a little chilly up here in New Hampshire. Woke up to 25 degree weather, and I don't think it's going to hit maybe low 40s today, and by golly, it's only going to get colder as we as we move along up until you know March. So, hey, that's the way it is. Uh, I hope it's I hope it's pleasant where you are. But if you're in the heating business, I hope it gets really cold really soon, and uh, and that gives you lots to do. Uh, glad you're with us today. Thank you so much for being with us on this Tuesday uh, afternoon, morning, or evening wherever you are. Again, uh, today's topic is a really fun one. It's a little bit different for us, but it's uh, about closely spaced T's, low loss headers and buffer tanks when we're piping up mod con boilers. Um, it's different, you know, they're, they're, they, they are different ways of doing the same thing, but why would you use one approach instead of the other? Where would you use one approach of the, instead of the other? And why would you use one approach instead of the other? So uh, a lot of interesting ways to look at this uh, this particular topic, and hopefully by the end of the, the program, we'll be able to share with you um, the why, the who's, the what's, the where's, and the why. So you, when you leave here, you'll know uh, you'll you'll have a good idea of when, where, and why you should use each option. Um, just a, a, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Again, uh, as always with webinars, you can see me. I can't see you. That's just the way it is. Uh, it, best way to deal with a webinar is to, to, to stay engaged, is to have a pen and a pad of paper in front of you and take notes. Okay, yes, this is being recorded. Yes, tomorrow you will get an email from us with a link to that recording, so you can watch it as many times as you want. But the best way to stay engaged on a webinar is to take notes, that, that way you follow along, and you'll have a nice written record of, of what goes on. The other thing I, I, I implore you guys to do is to ask questions. Uh, as many as you want about whatever about anything you want. If something sounds crazy, say so. If something doesn't make sense, please ask to explain it again. Or if you have an offshoot, please do that as well. And at the end of this session, I'll stay on as long as you guys want to answer whatever questions you have on pretty much anything. Um, the way you ask questions on your uh, on your uh, control panel, you should see a little section down at the bottom that says chat slash questions. Well, that's where you're going to ask your questions. So if you could go to that uh, that section of your control panel right now for me and just type in where you're from and what kind of a day it is. That way I'll know that you know how to do that. That's going to be where you ask your questions. And I see David from Kansas City has already, uh, already uh, uh, commented. It's cold there in KC. We got snow in Chicago. Oh boy. And it's moving east too. I, I see that up in northern New England. We're going to get a bunch of snow. We've got Anchorage, Alaska, which I'm sure, uh, Michaela, you're already in the throes of winter. We got Nova Scotia, or uh, we got sunny Orlando, Florida. What are you doing here? Get out of here, Orlando. What's going on? Um, okay, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Connecticut, Ohio, Colorado Springs, beautiful city, one of my favorites. Meadow Muffins was a great night spot. I don't know if it's still open. Uh, if it's still open there, Paul, but Meadow Muffins was a, was a fun place to be back in the uh, in, in younger days. Uh, Arizona, I'm jealous. Cleveland, Ohio, Southern uh, Ontario, cold. Okay, great. Well, hey, well, listen, folks, welcome. We're glad you're with us today, and uh, and thanks for checking in. That way we know where you all are from, and, uh, and yeah, it's getting colder, it, unless you're in Orlando hey, or Arizona, if it's getting colder. <laughs> so let's get started with Takeo Tuesday. And uh, about closely spaced tees, low loss headers, and buffer tanks. And we're all talking about mod con boiler piping. And why mod cons? Well, mod cons, man, they're just plain different, okay? You don't pipe them up the way you pipe up normal boilers or quote unquote. I, I guess that's maybe an old school way of looking at it. You don't pipe up mod con boilers the way you pipe up cast iron boilers, all right? Uh, mod con boilers, I think, now fall under the realm of normal boilers in our world. So you pipe up mod con boilers in a unique way. And for us, it's because we deal with del system delta T's of around 20 degrees, all right? Uh, we, we design our systems to 20 degree delta T's and we will very commonly have wider delta T's across the heat exchanger of the mod con boiler we have to pipe them up in a way 
that gives us something called hydraulic separation. And we're going to discuss that in a second. But we got to keep the two flows separate simply because the dynamics are different. Okay, the dynamics are different between those two flow rates. Uh, we like a nice wide delta T on the boiler. Uh, the system might have a delta T of 20, or maybe sometimes even 10 if it's radiant floor heat. So we have to we have to make those two play nicely together. And the way we do that is primary secondary piping with a wee bit of a twist. All right, with a wee bit of a twist, and we call that twist moose antler piping and you'll see some of the pictures later on that'll kind of explain why we call it moose antler piping primary secondary piping with a cast iron boiler is designed specifically to protect that boiler against low return water temperatures it's simply a primary loop that goes from the gazauta hole of the boiler around the mechanical room and back into the gazinda side of the boiler and then with closely spaced T's, you take secondary uh, uh, runs off of that primary loop. This is a little bit different, all right? The, with, with ModCon piping, it's a little bit different because we don't need to protect the boiler. We don't want to protect the boiler. So it's that primary secondary piping with a twist that we talked about. The other thing we have to deal with is a... Uh, in many models is a high head loss heat exchanger, which is going to put a little bit of onus on our circulator sizing. That's this pump right here. We have to size that circulator appropriately. It's not as hard as you think at the end of the session, we're gonna talk about uh, how to do that. And it might surprise you that that circulator does not have to be humongous in a lot of cases. So we're gonna, go, we're gonna cover all of these different topics today and hopefully be able to answer some questions for you. So with T's, low loss headers and tanks, we're gonna discuss the three W's. The first is what are they? The first W is what, what are they? What are these piping arrangements all about? The next one is when should you use them? When should you use one instead of the other? And the most important one is why. Why you should use one instead of the other in certain applications. My old man used to tell me, knowing how is good, but knowing why is better because those who know how will always work for those who know why. So in all of our sessions, I'm sure if you've been to these before, you know, we really want to focus on the why, because the why is what separates the professional from the handyman, right? The professional knows how, but he also knows why. Why am I doing it this way? And why is it important? So we're going to discuss heavy, heavy why. And the biggest why about really even caring about this is, Hydraulic separation. It's all about hydraulic separation. We want to keep the flows separate. We want to keep the boiler flow separate from the system flow because, as we said earlier, in many cases, those flows are going to be different and we've got to resolve that somehow so nobody interferes with each other. What you're looking at here is what we call moose antler. It's a little bass backwards, but we call it moose antler piping. Uh, you have a primary loop. Now, a lot of people will call these different things. As long as you know which one's the primary and which one's the secondary, that's important. We have the boiler loop. We have the boiler circulator and the boiler loop that's going to be pumping water through the boiler to be reheated and then back into what we call the system loop. All right, and we have closely spaced T's right down here. What we're doing is we're injecting BTUs, we're injecting heated up water back into the system to heat up the house. So we pipe it up in this primary, secondary, or moose antler manner. So we have, again, the boiler loop and the system loop, and the flow rates are different and we have to be able to resolve that. So that's closely spaced T's and that's how we keep the flow rate separate, the flow separate and the important part is right here, your closely spaced T's and we'll discuss that. We wanna make sure that the circulators don't interfere with each other for as much of the time as we can. There's gonna be instances folks where they do and there's really, in many cases, there's no way around it, especially if you're zoning with zone valves and, and have a variable speed pump or even if you don't have a variable speed pump, in a lot of cases, you simply can't get around that. You will, they will interfere. We just want to minimize that. All right. Uh, so we want to make sure they don't interfere with one another. So here's your moose antler closely spaced T's piping. Here's a buffer, or here's a, uh, a, a hydraulic separator. Okay. That's this guy right here. It's, it's a combination of a, a basically closely spaced T's being piped for you as a convenience item in combination with some mass of hot water. 
All right, so it's a little mini tank, if you will. And it does a very good job of keeping the flows separate. It does a really good job of keeping those flows separate. The third option, of course, is your buffer tank. And a buffer tank is really nothing more than a really big hydraulic separator, all right? Or low loss header, if you will. So if you take a look at HS1, this guy right here, okay? That's your hydraulic separator. It's a small tank with four holes in it, all right? A buffer tank is a big tank with four holes in it, okay? Can you do it with two holes? Yeah, but you're out, your piping outside of that starts to get a little bit complicated. Four holes, if you want simplicity, simply works very well. Um, it's a big hydraulic separator. And there are instances where you're gonna to wanna to use that instead of a hydraulic separator, which we'll discuss. So with any one of these three piping arrangements, our goal, is hydraulic separation to make sure the circulators don't interfere with each other for as much of the time as we possibly can have that. So that's the goal behind all three of these things. Let's talk about closely spaced tees for a minute. I'm gonna check real quick if we have any questions. Nope, everybody's just still checking in on where they're from, terrific. And again, you have questions, just type them on in. Uh, don't really wait till the end of the class to, to, to take your questions. I'll take them as they come. So as you, as you think of them, shoot them in and we'll, we'll answer them as we go as best we can. Uh, if you're gonna do closely spaced tees, here's maybe an H, we got three Ws, here's an H, here's the how part. Some things for you to think about, the ABCs of closely spaced T's. The spacing is important here. In uh, dimension A, which is basically between the two T's, we want them closely spaced. So that's four pipe diameters max. So if it's one inch pipe, we're talking four inches center to center, all right? Um, keep them as close together as you can. The further apart you have them, or the farther apart you have them, let's use the right word, the farther apart you have them, the more pressure loss there is in between the two T's. So we like to keep them nice and close together. So again, flow through your primary loop will not interfere with or create or influence flow through your secondary loop and vice versa. So we wanna keep those two T's as close together as we can. So that's called your common piping, your common piping. And we're looking at four pipe diameters max. Now your B dimensions on the Gazauta side of one of the T's or the Gazinda side of the other, the inlet and the outlet, we're looking at a eight pipe diameter minimum inlet, okay? So this guy right here, if the flow is coming this way, all right, if the flow is coming, let's see if I can get this, my pen here, here, if the flow is coming this way, all right, we want eight pipe diameters minimum on the Gazinda side. On the Gazauta side, we want four pipe diameters minimum. So again, if it's one inch, we're looking at eight inch pipe right here, or eight inches of pipe here, and we're looking at four inches of pipe on the other side minimum, all right, minimum. Now, this is gonna get interesting in a second. If you are going down to, an, uh, to a heating outlet as shown here with, with C, then you wanna create a thermal trap, and that's about a, a minimum of 18 inches. So you might go down and then up, uh, to create a thermal trap if necessary, if necessary. Okay, a uh, question from William Bruno, will heat exchangers be addressed? Not today, but we can address those in future presentations and we will. So uh, thank you, William, but we won't, be, we won't be dealing with them specifically today. Alrighty, so there's your ABCs of closely spaced T's. What does that look like in practice? Well, let's take a look. Um, <clears throat> I have a one inch header here, a one inch pipe. So the two A diameters, what would they be? What would the spacing be in both of those A diameters in that common piping between those closely spaced T's? You should type in your answer once you know it. Uh, I wanna see where you're, where you're at. So what is your, uh, what is your uh, the, the spacing, the minimum spacing between those, those uh, closely spaced T's in diameter A? Type in your answer when you know it. Uh, yep, we got four inch, we got four inches max. It's four inches max. So that's in, in diameter A, that's a maximum of four pipe diameters. Okay, that's what you're looking for, four pipe diameters. Now, what about B? Let's take a look at B. What about, what's the minimum spacing right there between the outlet of the first one and the inlet of the second one? Let's type in your answer there and see what you have, all right? So we have an eight, 
Well, let's see if we got any other answers. What do you guys think out there? The minimum spacing between the Gazauta on one side and the Gazinta on the other. Yeah, we got it, guys. It's 12 inches because remember, minimum four inches on the inlet, minimum eight inches on the outlet. So 12 inches is is really probably a good number to have, good safe number to have between those two those two outlets, if you will, those two secondaries or those two uh, delivery units, if you will. So yeah, an a uh, so 12 inches. Question would be why 12? Well, why well first why four pipe diameters? That one's pretty simple. What goes into a T? has to come out of a T, all right? What goes into a T has to come out of a T. So if I've got four gallons a minute entering this T and I take out one gallon a minute, I'm gonna have three gallons a minute going from this outlet to this inlet. If I've got one gallon a minute going up here through the boiler, coming back down into here, all right? That's again, one gallon a minute, joining with the three gallons a minute here, what do I have coming out? That's gonna be four gallons a minute. What we're trying to do is eliminate the pressure drop between those two T's. Remember, water's lazy and stupid. Yeah, we've got a circulator going here, but it, what we're trying to do is when that circulator's not running, is essentially make it so the water takes the easiest path, which in this case would be straight ahead, right through these two T's. It doesn't want to, nor should it be even encouraged to, Take a look up there and say, I wonder what's up there. Maybe we should take a little trip and see. The longer, the wider those two T's are spaced, the more possibly, the more likely that is to happen, which we don't want to happen unless that circulator is actually on and running. So we keep those nice and close. The closer, the better, but four pipe diameters is a good number. Now, why 12 inches? Why do we want 12 inches between those two? Well, we have both smooth flow and chaotic flow. And it's gonna take 12 inches for that chaotic flow to turn back into smooth flow. So what's gonna happen right here is again, we have some flow going this way, some flow going that way, and then some flow coming back here and they're gonna meet and mix right here. When that happens, we get chaotic flow. So it's gonna take about, oh, I don't know, a good eight inches for that chaotic flow to smooth out, and then another four inches, uh, of, uh, another four inches or eight inches rather, to become truly smooth flow. So uh, we get we we get good flow and good flow characteristics in that second outlet. So 12 inches is what it's going to take for that chaotic flow to turn into nice smooth flow, and we're good to roll here for performance. So those are kind of the ABCs, the fundamentals of closely spaced T's, and why we pipe them up the way we do in this type of an application. So the three W's for closely spaced T's. In your basic mod con boiler situation, you're dealing with one set of closely spaced T's where the boiler connects to that header, okay? For the boiler loop connects to the system loop. So again, keeping those T's close together, that's the important part. So what it is, it's your go-to mod con piping arrangement for most of your applications or many of your applications, let's put it that way for many of your standard applications. When should you use this? Well, my good friend, Anthony Reichow taught me this many years ago. And I mentioned you, Anthony, because I see you on the, I see you on the attendee list. And this is, this, I learned this from you. When should you use closely spaced tees? Well, if it's a single zone repipe, so you're taking out an old boiler with a single zone <clears throat> for the entire house, you get the old cast iron boiler out, you're putting in a mod con boiler in. Yeah, we're talking, we're fine here. Okay, we're taught we're fine here with your closely spaced T's. Essentially, if the zone or zones that you have, and if you say you have it, maybe you have two or three small, two or three zones, but if the size of those zones is larger than the boiler's minimum firing rate, meaning the BTU load of the of each of those zones is higher or larger than that boiler's minimum firing rate and its turndown ratio your closely spaced T's arrangement is fine, okay? That'll work and work just fine. It's simple, it's easy, and it works dandy in most applications. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's when you would use your closely spaced T's. And that's a lot of the, lot of the instances that you're gonna be dealing with. Next on the list is your low loss header or hydraulic separator. They're kind of the same thing, they're just different names for it. Your hydraulic separator is next on the list. 
And it's simply all of that that closely spaced T stuff built for you. The name says it's all, says it all. It is a hydraulic separator. It separates the two sides and it does it very, very well and very, very easily. There's never a wrong time to use a hydraulic separator. In instances where you could use closely spaced T's but choose to use a hydraulic separator, hey, go for it. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I, uh, it's in, in many cases, it's a convenience item, and in many cases, it's a space saver. So you need to make sure you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. But in, but it's never wrong to use a low loss header uh, high, slash hydraulic separator in lieu of closely spaced tees. All right. In in this case, there are different sizes. At Takeo, we make small ones that are simply piping convenience items. They don't have a lot of water content, but they do the job of hydraulic separation. Larger ones are available. That come, some of them come insulated. Many of them come with um, a, a collision medium or a coalescent medium for air separation and dirt separation. Typically, you find those in commer like commercial applications or commercial applications, not so much residentially, uh, but they do exist. The larger the the hydraulic separator, the more important this becomes. And it's a place for a system sensor. It's a well for a system sensor. And when you have a larger hydraulic separator, and by extension, if you have a buffer tank, this is a great way to control the boiler. All right. What, the way it would work is your thermostats would turn on your circulator or circulators for the heating system, but they don't fire the boiler. What they'll do is they'll try to draw off the mass that is within the, within the uh, hydraulic separator. When the temperature in that hydraulic separator drops to a sufficiently low level, the sensor picks that up and then it fires the boiler and then we recharge. So it just kind of separate, not only does it hydraulically separate, it electronically separates the system from the boiler and can add some efficiency. More applicable in buffer tanks because there's simply more water in them, but there may be instances with hydraulic separators where you might use that as well, all right? Really, again, what it is, it's a big open space in the piping. And big open spaces in the piping, velocity slows down. You do get some air separation, so this vent up top is really important. And if you have, uh, again, if you have a dirt mag separation built in, there'd be a magnet down here. Any magnetic crud would simply fall down to the bottom, and you can drain it out with that drain down at the bottom as well. So that's the benefit of a of of one of these things when the velocity slows down and there's a big open space. And we keep the boiler flow separate from the system flow, all right? We keep those two separate. And as you can see right in here, there's mixing. There's mixing of the water going out to the system and there's mixing of the water going back to the boiler, all right? So we need to be cognizant of that. We need to understand what that's all about. Best applications and how do we, how do we uh, figure out our temperatures uh, let's talk about that now. Your best applications are going to be uh, in instances where the system GPM is greater than the boiler GPM. Now, that happens a lot, right? That does happen a lot. But the other instance is, is when you uh, combine that with a lot of zones, and the zones, the smaller zones, are about the same BTU load as the boiler's lowest firing rate. What we're trying to do here is manage short cycling as best we can. So the instances where you really want to use a, a hydraulic separator would be when the system GPM is significantly larger than the boiler GPM, but the smallest zone load, BTU loads, are about the same as or in the neighborhood as the lowest firing rate in that boiler. So here, here's an example that I want to share with you in terms of water temperature, okay? What we have here is a, a, a system, okay, that's 90,000 BTUs. All right, I got a 90,000 BTU load on this side of the system, okay, over here, 90,000 BTUs. The required supply water temperature on that side is 150 degrees under design conditions, 150 degrees. And my design is, uh, I'm designing around a delta T of 20. All right, so the water goes out at 150, it's gonna come back at 130, all right? Pop quiz, what is the system flow rate? All combined, all zones calling, what's my flow rate on the, 
the delivery side of that hydraulic separator. And the hint is GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. All right. Let's see what you got. Let's see what you got. See if you can come up with a with a uh, uh, a gallons per minute flow rate. And we got a couple here. Yep, Jill has it. Lauren has it. Anybody else? What's the gallons per minute flow rate on the delivery side of that system? And I see a couple of questions in here, and I'll try to get to them as as quick as I can. Yep, Neil, David, yep, y'all got it. Nine gallons per minute. Nicholas, excellent. Nine gallons per minute. Ninety thousand divided by twenty times five hundred, or ten thousand. 90,000 divided by 10,000, nine gallons per minute. That's what we're looking for on the delivery side of the system. Now, again, that water's coming back at 130. The question I have for you now, now my boiler, uh, I'm setting up my boiler at a 40 degree delta T. And if I look in the manual of the boiler manufacturer, it says at a 40 degree delta T, meaning the water comes back at one temperature, it goes out 40 degrees higher. That flow rate's four and a half gallons per minute. Okay, so you see I got nine gallons a minute over here. I got four and a half gallons a minute over here. That hydraulic separator is keeping those two separate. But the question I have for you is this. Based on what you see here, what water temperature does the boiler have to make under design conditions for this to work? What water temperature does the boiler have to make in order for this system to do its job under design conditions. Let's see what you got. All right, there's no math here. Let's see if you can figure it out. There's no formula. Let's see if you can figure it out. Let's see if you can infer it. There's a couple ways to do it. There's a heavy math way, which I'm not gonna bore you with today, but there's actually a simple way to infer this. What water temperature does the boiler have to make in order for this system to work? Understand that there's mixing going on in that, uh, in that, uh, uh, in that uh, hydraulic separator. So we're gonna have to have that boiler make what water temperature? Dave, you got it, baby. Good, good job. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Let's see how, how we're doing here. Yep. Patrick, you have it as well. Paul, not quite, a little high there. 170, 170. Yeah, the boiler's gonna have to make 170 degree water under design conditions. How do we know that? Well, what's the water temperature coming back from the system? It's 130, right? Yeah, there's some mixing going on in here, but we'll, you know, without without an ex, extra math, we're going to have to figure. We're going to we're going to deal with 130. If the boiler has a 40 degree delta T, is operating on a 40 degree delta T. Well, 130 coming back, one, you know, 40 degree delta T in the boiler. Well, for 130 and 40, that's 170, man. We call it 170. We call it 170. So we want that boiler to make 170 degree water. Michael says, looks like a typical combi boiler scenario. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Very good. Very good. Excellent. 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 So the three W's for hydraulic separators, the three W's for hydraulic separators. Uh, again, it's a packaged closely spaced T. All right. It's all packaged for you. And it includes some mass. It's a piping convenience item. It helps save space. It helps saves time. Uh, but it also, again, that mass help, does help ser serve a purpose to uh, address some short cycling issues. When? When you have multiple zones and those zones are about the same size as the minimum boiler firing rate. A little higher, a little lower, we're okay. But if that's that's the case, when they're about the same size as the minimum boiler firing rate, you want to default to a hydraulic separator. But as we said earlier, when it comes to you know, closely spaced T's or hydraulic separators, you're never wrong going with a hydraulic separator. Never wrong, never wrong. And lastly, why convenience and space, and again, helps address short cycling with the with when you're in a multi-zone system. All righty. Very good. Very good. Excellent, folks. I'm glad to uh, I, thank you for the interaction. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I want to go back to a question here earlier. Are the manifolds that are available uh, a hydraulic separator? I'm not, Nick, I may want to re rephrase that. I'm not sure what you mean there. Uh, a, man, a manifold, a hydraulic separator, any, any, a lot of boiler manufacturers will sell a manifold that kind of goes underneath the boiler and kind of has two gazintas and a couple of gazoutas, that's their version of a low loss header. So again, it keeps the flow separate. So if that's what you mean, Nick, I think, yeah, that would certainly, that would certainly qualify. Yeah. 
And then what does the why does the return water go back to the supply pipe, thus dropping the temperature to everything downstream? In that application, and that that's a that's a great question. On in that instance that we talked about, that is a that would be a, a situation where you have a uh, you have a loop, and you're just taking uh, supply and return off of each off of that loop, and then for one application, then downstream you're taking a supply and return off of another. You have cascading water temperatures. If you have that situation, if you are doing cascading water temperatures, obviously you start with your highest temperature thing, highest temperature load first, and then the lower temperature load, and then a lower temperature load and so forth. You got to plan around that. Okay, you got to plan around that, obviously. So good. Thank you. Good question. Good question. Good question. Is that right? Okay, excellent, folks. Let's keep her going, man. Let's keep her going. All righty. Now, what about buffer tanks? What is a buffer tank? Well, as we said earlier, buffer tank is merely a wicked big hydraulic separator, okay? It's just, we, we fed the thing steroids and it just blew up, man. It's a big hydraulic separator. It's a tank. It's a tank with four holes in it. There's nothing else in there uh, other than, you know, space, okay? Big open space in the piping. It's water content. We're talking about water content here and that's what that's what we're after, okay? Because it's all about the mass, my man. It's all about the mass. We want mass in this system to prevent short cycling. When do we use these things? We use a buffer tank when we have a lot of low, a lot of zones, and a, a lot of those zones are really little. Take that to mean radiant floor heating, but not exclusively. There may be other instances where you want this, but it most commonly happens with radiant floor heating. So we've got that bathroom zone. We've got a small zone over here. They're micro zones. Okay, the, the right way to do radiant floor heating is to zone the the the, the is to, to 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 zone it completely. I mean, you really need a lot of zones for a properly functioning radiant floor heating system. Um, so with with that, if we have small zones, if they're the only zone calling or a small group of zones are calling, and those loads are considerably lower considerably lower than the boiler's lowest firing rate, we're going to short cycle like crazy, <laughs> okay? And when we short cycle like crazy, nothing good happens. We, we have very poor uh, cycle efficiency. A boiler that short cycles never really has the opportunity to, to get efficient, number one. And number two, if we're cycling on and off and on and off and on and off and on and off, what happens to every moving part in that system? We're, we're short cycling those parts into an early grave, which we don't want to do. Those become service issues. And so we're putting in a system, it's not gonna be as efficient as it could or should be. And you know what? We know for a fact, stuff's gonna break probably sooner rather than later, but hey, go get them. Buffer tank helps uh, address both of those issues and gives your customer the performance and the life, the life expectancy, a life expectancy that they're paying for. So again, why do we need mass? As we said, short cycling, we take care of that short cycling. So again, it's the same as a hydraulic separator, only bigger. Now you see some short, some short stubby Barney rubble looking tanks, and then you see some tall skinny tanks, um, tanks of different sizes. The question always comes up, well, how do I know what size I need? All right, how do I know what size I have to have for my buffer tank? Well, your piping schematic, again, is, it's, it's like a hydraulic separator, but how do you size one? How do I know what size, what, how many gallons I need? Well, there's a very simple math formula for that. This one, jot down as we go along so you'll have it, but again, you'll see this also in the, uh, in, in the recording as well, but it's pretty simple math. It's just three steps. It's just three steps. Step one, you need to determine the minimum boiler firing rate, the minimum, right, <laughs> the minimum boiler firing rate. You want to find the lowest firing rate of that boiler based on its turn down ratio. Once you find that, the next thing you want to find is the BTU load of the smallest zone. And this is, again, under design conditions because we're talking about worst case scenarios. So the minimum boiler firing rate and then the BTU load of the smallest zone. Once you have those two, you're going to subtract one from the other. You subtract the BTU load of the smallest zone from the minimum boiler firing rate. So minimum boiler firing rate minus the BTU load of the smallest zone is going to give you something called the BTU surplus. This is just the extra BTUs that boiler is making at the minimum firing rate. So minimum boiler firing rate minus the BTU load of the smallest zone gives you what we call the BTU surplus. That's step one. Step two. We want to multiply that BTU surplus 
multiply that BTU surplus times your desired minimum run time. Meaning whenever that boiler fires, how long do I want it to fire at a minimum? At a minimum, okay? And we use 10 minutes as a number, okay? As a good number. That boiler fire, when that boiler fires, if it fires for at least 10 minutes, that's, we're happy with that. We're happy with that. So BTU surplus times your desired minimum runtime of 10 minutes gives you something called the cycle factor. Right, that's step two. BTU surplus times 10 minutes, your desired minimum runtime, gives you what we call the cycle factor. Third and final step. The cycle, we're going to divide the cycle factor by our delivery side delta T times 500. The delivery side, not the boiler side, the delivery side delta T times 500. Typical residential hydronics, that would be 20. Residential radian, it might be 10. Okay, that's going to matter. All right. So that delta cycle factor divided by delta T times 500 gives you the tank capacity in gallons, the recommended tank capacity in gallons. So minimum boiler firing rate minus the BTU load of the smallest zone, that gives you your BTU surplus. BTU surplus times your desired minimum runtime, we're talking 10 minutes, gives you your cycle factor, and then cycle factor divided by your delivery side delta T times 500 equals your tank capacity in gallons. All right. Pretty straightforward. Let's take a look and see what we have. Let's do an example, if you will. So here's a, we're just gonna do a quickie, all right? So I've got 150,000 BTU ModCon boiler with a 10 to one turndown ratio, a 10 to one turndown ratio. 150,000 10 to one turndown ratio, what is my lowest firing rate? What is the lowest firing rate to that boiler, of that boiler? See if you, see if you got it. Do, 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 do. Yeah, 15,000. Yep, Patrick, you got it. 15,000 BTUs. 15,000 BTUs. So that's our, our lowest firing rate for that boiler. 15,000 BTUs. Our smallest zone, little itty bitty zone, is 5,000 BTUs. So 15,000 BTUs minus 5,000 BTUs. So that's the lowest firing rate minus the BTU load of the smallest zone, that's going to give us a BTU surplus of 10,000. That's our BTU surplus, 10,000. That's step one. Step two, we're going to multiply the BTU surplus times our desired minimum runtime of 10 minutes. All right, so 10,000 times our 10-minute 10 desired minimum runtime is going to give us a cycle factor, a cycle factor of 1 100,000. That's step two. Step three, we're going to divide the cycle factor times our system side delta T times 500. Our system side delta T times 500. Now, in this example, our system is all radiant floor heating, residential radiant floor heating that we have designed to a delta T of 10. So 10 times 500 is 5,000. That's why it's important to know what the delta T is on that, that other side. 10 times 500 is 5,000. 100,000 divided by 5,000 tells us we're going to be looking for a 20 gallon tank. All right, we want a 20 gallon buffer tank, ideally. Ideally. Now, maybe you can't find a 20 gallon buffer tank. Maybe you can only find a 15 gallon buffer tank. Does that mean you, you, you sit down and cry and say, I can't do this? If you can only find a 15 gallon buffer tank and you install it, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? All right. If you can only put in a 15 gallon buffer tank, what is the worst thing that's going to happen? What do you think? Yeah, you'll have a little shorter runtime. Yeah. You'll have a little shorter runtime. The point is, you know what? At least Maybe I get an eight-minute runtime or a seven-minute minimum runtime. The point is I'm not going to have a 30-second runtime or a one-minute runtime, all right? That's the worst thing that's going to happen, okay? Well, what if you can't find a 20-gallon tank, but you can only find a 25-gallon tank? You can only find a 25-gallon tank. You have a 25-gallon tank and you put it in. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? 
Hey, your runtime might be a little longer than 10 minutes. Hey, call a cop, all right? It's not a bad thing at all. Question came in, is 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 bigger better? Uh, good question, Tom. B bigger's not bad. There's no downside to a bigger buffer tank other than cost. There's no downside to a bigger buffer tank other than cost. It's just like expansion tanks, right? You cannot oversize an expansion. You can undersize an expansion tank, and that might bite you in the butt, but you can't. Uh, the only downside to oversizing an expansion tank is cost. So in this case, no, you really can't un you can't oversize a tank. Um, again, it's just it's just a, a matter of dollars and cents. Just a matter of dollars and cents. All righty, very good, very good. Got some questions coming in. Again, we had a, if bigger is better. Uh, Twelve and a half minute runtime during shoulder seasons, not a bad thing at all. Uh, okay, why the firing rate per hour and the cycle time in minutes? There's math. Uh, there's math and conversion stuff there. That's I'm 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 going to give you you you, you can call it six tenths or what is it, ten minutes is one sixth of a of an hour. It's just the way the conversion works to to keep the to keep it to keep it simple. Okay, to be uh, to be to keep it all simple. Um, do, 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 are either of these systems needed for an application where it's one zone but multiple loops? A big hobby shop and a garage for for radiant heat. Good question, or no? That's one zone. Right, that's one zone. Then your closely spaced T's are going to be fine for you. Okay, that's going that's going to work out pretty well for you. All right, so very good, very good, excellent, good questions, folks. Good questions, appreciate it. Now, as we get back here, buffer tanks, the three W's, the what? It's a really big hydraulic separator. That's the pretty much straightforward and simple. A really big hydraulic separator. Uh, when should you use them? When you have lots of zones that are smaller than the lowest boiler firing rate. And then the why, hey, you want to minimize the ticking time bomb that is short cycling. It kills your efficiency and it basically, you know, you, you, every moving component in that system, moving part on that system is walking the plank and doesn't know it. Okay, at some point you're going to prematurely kill something and uh, it could be a, a blower motor on the boiler. It could be an, ignition, an igniter or an ignition module. It could be something that's going to be, when it goes, you get no heat, all right? And if that happens, usually that's going to happen within a month of the warranty running out. That's <laughs> just kind of the way that works. So again, what, what it is, really big hydraulic separator. When should you use it? When you have a lot of smaller zones, zones that are smaller than the minimum boiler firing rate. And why? Minimize the ticking time bomb that is short cycling. There are folks that say, hey, you know what? Doesn't matter what I'm doing, I'm putting in a buffer tank. Not wrong. Not wrong at all. Absolutely not wrong. Not always necessary, but it's never wrong. Okay. It is never wrong. Same thing with, you know, when, with, uh, you know, you could use closely spaced T's, but choose to use a low loss header or a hydraulic separator. Not wrong. Never wrong. It's never wrong to do it. So again, understand when and what applications these might be most applicable and you can make the best decisions possible. All righty, excellent. I want to wrap this up by uh, having a quick discussion on a topic that um, uh, uh, Rick Mayo really brought to, brought to the light for, for me personally, because I never really thought about it all that much. Just said, what does the, what boiler, you know, what, 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 what pump comes with a ModCon boiler you put that in? Right, which you know you should know. I mean, if you've done cast iron boilers long enough, you know they come packaged with a 007 or now a 007E. And is that always the right pump? Well, no. But you always say, well, the Modcom boilers are different. They must know what they're doing. They put that pump there for a reason. We'll go with that. Yeah, we need to think about that for a minute. We need to think about that because it depends on how you read the information in the manual and every boiler does come with a manual and you know what's really cool about the manual is that it is free and virtually all of the answers you seek can be found there for the most part now you may have to work a little bit to find it but they're there they're there so we're going to talk about sizing the boiler pump for a modcon and why it's important all right so let's take a look I'm, I'm using uh, the Burnham Alpine here as an example, but similar stuff is going to be in virtually everyone's uh, uh, boiler, everyone's manual. All right. So the Alpine boiler models, ALP 080B through ALP 285B, are factory supplied with circulators. This is right in the book. Okay. This is right in the book. All right which are sized for near boiler piping equivalent length of 50 feet, meaning this 
through the heat exchanger and back, that is the equivalent of 50 feet of pipe. All right, that's what the, pump, the, the pumps are sized for. See table 13 for details. Mm, details, always good to have. Here's, their, here's the, 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 the little clause that's in every installation manual by, by every manufacturer. It is the installer's responsibility to ensure a proper installation and where applicable, proper circulator speed setting for the boiler circulator to achieve a required flow rate. Where near boiler piping exceeds 50 feet of equivalent, alternate circulator selection may be required. Now, here's the thing. If you get a three-speed circulator, let me, I'm just going to do a quick poll of the audience. If there, a three-speed circulator comes with the boiler, 99 times out of 99, what speed is that circulator going to be set to? <laughs> or more, more grammatically correct, to what speed is that three-speed circulator most likely going to be set? The highest, yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, let's, not, let's not mess around here, folks. Let's get, get, give it all she's got, Captain. All right, that's, that's the, the, the Star Trek, uh, you know, Scotty engineering me method. Yeah, give it all she's got. We can't go wrong. At least no one's going to freeze to death and blame us. High speed, high speed. Does it need to be? Should it be? What's the impact if it is? Well, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that. Okay, yeah, same as a furnace blower and cooling. It's on high, there you go, right. <laughs> so what does this tell us? If we look at the manual, the manual tells us all and the manual is free. That's what's so cool about manuals. They are free, man. And they give you the answers that you seek. So we're gonna look at the ALP 080B, all right? First thing it tells you is your boiler piping going into that header should be one inch, right? One inch, gazenta, one inch, gazauta. How about that? Really simple. The next several columns give you minimums and maximums. And the first column is your minimum required flow rate. This is the bare minimum you want going through that boiler. And this gives you a 35 degree delta T meaning the water comes in at one temperature, that, boil, that, that, that boiler is going to heat it up 35 degrees before it sends it back out. That's actually for a ModCon boiler, that's not a bad goal, okay? That's not a bad goal. So the minimum required flow rate at a 35 degree delta T is 4.2 gallons per minute, and that boiler head loss, that boiler head loss plus the piping, you know, uh, that, that equivalent piping that it's sized for, is going to be 4.8 feet of head. All right, we'll call it five. So if I want a 35 degree delta T across that boiler, my circulator is going to have to do 4.2 GPM at a little under five feet ahead. Gang, that ain't high speed. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you right now, it's not high speed. If you want to go to a 30 degree delta T, 4.9 GPM, higher flow rate means we're going to have higher head loss, 6.4 feet ahead. 25 degree delta T, we're pushing six gallons a minute now through that boiler, and we're pushing almost nine feet ahead through that boiler. And then the maximum flow rate, the one we don't want to do more than, gives us a 20 degree delta T across that boiler, 7.3 gallons a minute at 13.4 feet ahead. All right. Now, if we're, if we're really gaming this system and trying to get the maximum efficiency, let's have the widest delta T possible that we could have for that boiler, let's let's take a look at what would happen if I went with a 35 degree delta T and decided to go with 4.2 GPM at 4.8 feet ahead. So my circulator, my boiler circulator is going to need to do 4.2 GPM at four feet ahead. Well, what are we going to use? What circulator is going to make the most sense? Let's take a look at the blue lines here. Okay, the dub. This is a standard efficiency 0015 three speed circulator 4.2 gallons a minute at 4.8 feet ahead right about where that green line is you know hey if i'm using a 0010 three speed that's kind of just dead on accurate right we could, certainly could use that if however we were using the the standard garden variety three speed circulator the 0015 which is essentially the same circulator as you know the bng nrf 22 the grunfus 1558 they're all virtually identical I'm actually going to be working there, all right? And that's going to be at about four and a half gallons per minute 
at just under six feet ahead. So I'm not gonna have a 35 degree delta T there. Not, it might be closer to 30, but that's what's going to happen if I set that circulator to low speed. Not bad, not a bad solution. If I set it to medium speed, now if I follow the system curve, uh, to where it intersects the pump curve for medium speed. Now I'm looking at closer to six gallons a minute, maybe a little over six gallons a minute at a little at a little over 10 feet ahead, maybe close to 11 feet ahead, all right? So now we're pushing 25 degree delta T. Now we're pushing a 25 degree delta T. And if I set it to high, I'm at seven gallons a minute, I'm getting closer to a 20 degree delta T, all right? As the speeds go up, the flow rate through that boiler goes up, my delta T gets smaller. Is the system gonna work? Oh, heck yes. No one's gonna freeze to death and say it's your fault. But again, I'm, I'm impacting the efficiency of that system pretty dramatically simply by going to high speed or even me medium speed. Remarkable how much you can do with a three-speed circulator set to low speed. Now, lastly, what if we were to use a 0015 E3? A lot of circulators are coming with 0015 E3s, three setting variable speed ECM circulator. Again, 4.2 gallons a minute at 4.8 feet ahead. My golly, I'm looking at low speed right there. Low speed's five foot ahead, you know? Low speed's gonna be just fine. So not only is that circulator giving me the flow I need for my 35 degree delta T, I might be using maybe 18, maybe 20 watt, not even. I'm probably 17 to 18 watts of pumping power as opposed to 75 or 65 or 75 with uh, the 0015 set to low speed. Getting the same work done using a lot less electricity and I'm keeping that delta T nice and wide. All right, so that would be a great application there. Now, one of the things we commonly hear uh, is uh, particularly when it comes to delta T circulators being used as your system pump. So you don't use a delta, my golly, don't use a delta T pump on your as your system circulator in a ModCon. That thing's going to go so slow that you're going to have reverse flow through your T's, meaning the flow that, that that circulator is capable of is actually going to be less than, less than the flow rate that the boiler circulator is capable of. I got news for you. That's absolutely correct. That can happen. And it gets worse if you size your boiler pump incorrectly. But here's the news flash: it can also happen if you have a delta T pump as your a del, I'm sorry, a delta P pump, like a 0015 E3, a 0070, et cetera. If you have a, a, a delta P pump as your system pump, same thing can happen. There's no difference really between a delta T pump going slow and a delta P pump going slow. They're both going different kinds of slow. So in those cases, if you have zone valves and the zone valves are closing, yeah, the flow rate that circulator is going to give you is probably going to be less than the 4.2 that the boiler circulator wants. You're going to have some backwards flow. You can't get around it. Here's another news flash. As zones close, the same thing's going to happen with a fixed speed pump. All right. The same thing's going to happen with a fixed speed pump. Let me go back here real quick. So let's say all right, I'm going to be working right about here, okay, with my system pump. Let's say I got a double on my boiler pump. Let's say I got a 0015 on my um, on my as, as my system pump as well, a second one. And let's say my my I have it set to medium speed, six gallons a minute, with all zones calling at let's say it's going to be 11 feet ahead. That's where it's going to run. As zones close. All right, I have new system curves, right? As zones close, I have fewer holes for the water to go through. With fewer holes for the water to go through, the flow rate's gonna go down. So let's say I've got one zone calling, and that one zone might be at about two gallons a minute up here at about what looks to be about 13 and a half feet ahead. Well, boiler pump is pumping at a higher flow rate than the system pump. I'm gonna have backwards flow. All right, so understand it's kind of hard to avoid that. We just don't want it to happen all the time, okay? But a delta T pump going slow, delta P pump going slow are both all kinds of going slow, okay? And zones closing on a fixed speed pump, the flow rate's gonna go down because there's just simply fewer holes for all that flow to go through. You've got the same problem. 
So understand it more than likely will happen. I'll tell you the one time it probably won't happen is if you zone with circulators on your system side, all right? Then you might, you might have, it's, you're gonna be over pumping, but you might not, you might avoid that backwards pumping through the closely spaced teeth, all right? So things to think about. Now, hydraulic separator makes this problem go away. Buffer tank makes that problem go away as well. So excellent, cool, 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 cool. I hope that was helpful for you. Um, my friends, because that was a, that, this is a this is one of my favorite sessions to do. Um, so what I want to do is just uh, again open it up for questions. Let's see how we're doing uh, out there. So any questions you have, let's uh, let's see what you have here. Okay, um, yeah, works great with a buffer tank and a VT2218, our Delta T pump. Yeah, don't you have to add the piping loss to the 4.8? Now remember that circulator they what they built into that 4.8 was 50 feet of piping. And the equivalent of 50 feet of piping. That's where that number came from. So that's where we showed that one first, Carmine. That is built in. So you don't have to add that to it. If there's more, that's when they had that, that, that little, little clause there that says you're responsible if there's more than 50 feet, you know, then of equivalent piping. But that's where that's where the 4.8 uh, feet ahead came from. So let me know if that makes if that makes sense to you, Carmine. All right, very good. Opinions of reverse indirect as a buffer, out of size for DHW and the buffer. I there's a lot of ways to go. There are a lot of ways to do buffer tanks. I know they, they have a buffer tank where um, there's a the, the 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 indirect is the storage tank serves as a buffer tank and the coil makes the domestic hot water. So I mean, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. It, it, it helps you in two ways. It makes you domestic hot water and it is, uh, and it serves as a buffer tank. So it's absolutely a, a, a viable option, Michael. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. What does it hurt with reverse flow through the T's? Isn't that the good thing? So the boiler has enough flow? Well, the circulator is gonna make sure it has enough flow, right? In one way or the other, what goes into a T has to come out of a T. Circulator is gonna make sure you have enough flow, if not more. Here's a problem where that boiler circulator is oversized for the application. Maybe, like I said, if I set that thing to medium or high, okay, I've got seven, there's seven gallons a minute. That circulator's got to do seven gallons a minute. If the system, if the system is five gallons a minute, all right, remember that, that T, uh, that first T, what goes into, let me see if I can uh, go back to that, uh, to that slide real quickly. Um, do, 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 do. What's going to happen is, let's go back to it. Do, 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 do. Where are you? Right here. Here we go. Good question. What's going to happen is if this circulator is set for 7 GPM, okay, and I've got 5 GPM coming this way, okay, so I've got 5 entering here, I'm going to have 7 going this way. Where am I going to get the other two, right? Because I've got seven coming back that way. Well, I need five, so I'm going to have five going that away, okay? I'm going to have two gallons a minute going this way. The, 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 the downside of that is, yeah, we're going to have enough flow for the boiler, but the downside of that is, let's say I've got 130 degree water coming here and 170 degree water coming out. So right now I'm mixing two gallons of 170 with five gallons of 130. I'm not gonna have 130 degree water going back to the boiler. That boiler water is gonna be warmer and we're gonna short cycle some more and we're not gonna condense maybe as much as we could or should, all right? So that's the downside, that's the downside. We wanna try to avoid that as much as we can. I don't think we're ever going to be, be in a situation where we eliminate it completely. Again, unless you go with a with a, a hydraulic separator or a buffer tank, um, but that's the situation we're trying to avoid. So properly sizing this circulator is going to go a long way towards minimizing the impact. You might not be able to eliminate it, but we sure as heck can minimize it. And again, understand this about variable speed circulators. Slow is slow, right? A delta P pump going slow, a delta T pump going slow, or both going slow and fixed speed circulator zone valves close we back up the pump curve all right we have lower flow rates so the same thing's going to happen anyway so again you want to make sure you understand that that's going to happen and try to minimize the impact like i said hydraulic separator is never wrong 
buffer tanks never wrong. So it can it can help help mitigate those issues, but just understand that that's what can happen. Zadite, Zadite. Okay, okay, very good. I have piped. Uh, let's see, well, we have some more questions here. Uh, do, 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 do. I have piped the primary boiler loop backwards and it works fine. What drawbacks? The primary loop backwards. So your return. Let me understand that, uh, uh, Paul, if I got it. So basically, this pipe connects here. <laughs> and this pipe connects downstream. Yeah, I'm sure it works fine. All right, what's going to happen is you're 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 going to temper the water going back to the boiler. You're going to have a mix. Your mix is going to be before you get to the the gazinto of the boiler. You're going to be raising that water temperature, and basically it's it's the same thing as having reverse flow. Um, raise the return water temperature. Might short cycle some and uh, maybe not condense quite as much. Is it gonna work? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, again, define work. Are we heating the house and no one's complaining? There you go. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that'll that'll work That'll work and work just fine. Uh, again, ideal, different discussion, but uh, is it going to work and keep people from freezing to death? I would say yes, absolutely. Because what the scenario is here, people are gonna, aren't gonna freeze to death. We're just gonna, we're just minimizing we're minimizing the efficiency of the boiler. We're impacting the efficiency of the boiler and maybe the life of the, of the moving parts by, by encouraging short cycling. Very good, very good. Oh, they, guys, great questions today. Outstanding, outstanding. Really appreciate it. So keep them coming. I'm like I said, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got a, I've got an open hour here, so I can do, basically do whatever I want. Whatever questions you have, folks, please feel free to share them with us. I, 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 and whether it's about today's topic or any topic you really want to talk about at this point, happy to stay on as long as you all have some questions. And uh, I do appreciate the gift of your time. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really do appreciate. Uh, spending this time with Taiko and uh, uh, spending time with me. So it gives me somebody to talk to during the day other than the, uh, my four-legged friends who are, who thankfully didn't bark today. They almost always bark in the last 10 minutes of a webinar. Almost always bark at some point in the last 10 minutes of a webinar. Today, they, they were able to keep quiet. Maybe I'm, I'm tempting fate by bringing it up. <laughs> but, uh, but very good. Now, thank you so much for being with us. One question here from Ernest. With a buffer tank, do you set the temperature to the system temp? Doesn't that make the return water temp higher for the boiler as opposed to the T's? Good question. Let's think this one through. You want to set the boiler the 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 in a, in a buffer tank. You want to set the temperature for the system, right? For the delivery system. What's going out to the system? So if I need 150. I want to set that buffer tank for 150. Okay. Now, is that, and we want to maintain that temperature in that tank. Now, the boiler is going to run until we get to that temperature. So that's kind of how that works. If that, if that, if that's what you're asking, Ernest, um, yeah, we, uh, so we, the, we, we want to try and keep that temperature in the tank, the temperature that is necessary out in the system. Okay. We don't set it for that 170 like we did in our example with the, with the uh, with the, the 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 hydraulic separator, we would set the tank temperature at 150, and the boiler will do what it has to do to make that 150. All right, cool, cool. If the boiler if a boiler is piped backwards, the flow adds up, and you might exceed flow capacity uh, of the piping between the T's. Yeah, you very very well may. Uh, if if it's if if you yeah you you might have some velocity issues, but in a hunk of pipe that that far. Eh, we we got some we got some room. It, it would it cause some noise issues? Eh, four inches? I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, you you wouldn't again. You'd want to try to avoid that, but four inches is four inches, right? Does the supply for an indirect have to come off the primary, or, or can it come off the secondary? I believe this would be necessary for boiler supplied manifolds, says Nick. Uh, I've seen uh, for indirects, generally speaking, with mod cons, I've seen them piped right off of the boiler loop before you get to a buffer or closely spaced tees or uh or your um or your buffer tank uh, or your hydraulic separator usually comes off of the supply and return legs going into the into and out of the boiler so that's kind of where we would look at that nick uh better better place so let me see if i've got a i might have a drawing of that let's see what we have here boom 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 uh no let me go back 
Well, let me, I think we can come up with one right here. There we go. Yeah, here you see that picture with the uh, with the uh, the indirect taken off of the supply and return piping right to the boiler. If that makes sense. All right, let me know if that if that one answers your questions. Doop -doop 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 -doop. <laughs> this would be necessary for a boiler with supplied manifold. Yeah, there yeah there are no places on the supplied manifold or the or the, uh, the 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 hydraulic separator that they supply you with, Nick. Yeah, so you'd have to take them off on the piping to and from if you're using that for a, for an indirect. Yeah, I, I I think we're talking the same thing. Let me know if that answers your question. Yeah. Very good. All right. Terrific, terrific. Leroy says some boiler manufacturers use the sensor with outdoor reset. Yeah, you can certainly out do, do outdoor reset that way as well. Very good. All right, folks. Well, hey, more questions. Let's keep them coming. Let's keep them coming. Beautiful day today in New Hampshire. Nice and sunny, but cold, but cold. Let's see what the temperature today is kind of in that. I think it's going to be in that 40s, 40 range, low 40s. It was 25 this morning. The dogs looked at me and said, we want to go out. And I said, well, good luck. <laughs> Have a nice time. I'm staying right here. Uh, maybe that's why they're not barking. They're kind of, they're, they're waiting for me to go take them out somewhere, but that's, uh, that's okay. Um, but yeah, beautiful day here in New Hampshire. And um, hopefully it's nice where you are. I guess snowing in Chicago. I know the folks have some winter approaching. So again, in the heating business, these are good days, right? These are good days. These are the ones that get your, your, your blood pumping. Very good. All righty. Seems as though the questions have slowed down. So I'm going to say thank you to everybody. Really do appreciate it. What kind of dogs? Snuck one in there, Paul. What kind of dogs? I have a little Cocker Spaniel Poodle mix named Lola. She's a sweetheart. She is a sweetheart. She's about 18 pounds, thereabouts. And then a little a little Yorkshire Terrier uh, Maltese mix. We call him a Morky, <laughs> named Frankie. So we have Frankie and Lola. Frankie and Lola, and uh, Frankie's my Frank, Frankie's my special pal. You know, I mean, the 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 Lola is is partial to Heidi, and uh, Frankie's partial to me. So that's that's kind of the way it works. So it's the guys against the girls in this house, I guess. <laughs> but they're good little pups. They're good little pups. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to you, Nick, and happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there. Really do appreciate again appreciate the gift of your time. It's so much it's so special to be able to spend some time with you, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Ken, and thank you, Brian. Awesome. Well, folks, have a great rest of your Tuesday and a fantastic rest of your week. Uh, just know tomorrow, if you are so inclined, we will be having a similar presentation, not the same, but a similar presentation to this uh, on buffer tanks, et cetera, and piping on uh, Takeo After Dark. It'll be uh, part eight, the final edition of uh, our fall season of Takeo After Dark. And then we'll be taking a little break and then doing a winter season. Uh, but that'll be at 7 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow night. You can sign up, uh, go to our website and sign up for the uh, session. It'll be a heck of a lot of fun. And Dave Holdorf will be broadcasting this live from a uh, from a trade school in New Jersey. So we're very excited about that. We're doing a lot of different trade school, doing these live broadcasts from trade schools in front of live audiences for Takeo After Dark. So we're real excited about that. And we'll be doing again in the spring session. Our winter session of Takeo After Dark should start uh, so probably in early January. Our winter session will be a five-part series on the new Takeo System M air to water heat pump. So over the course of five weeks, we will get you up to speed on this interesting new technology for Takeo and uh, the right applications for an air to water heat pump, as well as the not so right applications, the ones you want to avoid for an air to water heat pump. So we will talk to you about that over the course of uh, January, January and into March uh, of 2023 on the Takeo System M air to water heat pump. So with that, I'm going to say thanks again. Have yourselves a wonderful rest of your Wednesday and a wonderful rest of your week. Wonderful Thanksgiving holiday as well. And uh, we will see you on the other side in early December. Take care, everybody. <music>